Hi everyone, it's Cindy again from Meet Cindy. If you enjoy watching about personal finance, building general generational wealth, and achieving financial freedom, please don't forget to su subscribe and press the like button. Great, so today we have Michael Zuber, an author of One Rental at a Time. So I'm, I was very interested in his background and how he achieved financial freedom uh, with buy and hold rental properties. And he was able to acquire almost 200 rental properties and build passive income. So let's welcome Michael. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. This is, it's always a fun conversation to uh, hopefully inspire others to take, you know, steps on their journey to financial freedom. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. I really like your mission. You know, you're, you're giving back. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, I see the 500 student deals right there. Um, yeah. You know, want to share what it is? Yeah, so one of the things I'm trying to do is really give back. And when you try to give back, it's, it's always hard to figure out, is it really helping anyone? So something I did on June 1st of this year, so it just started June 1st of this year, is I'm trying to see if one rental at a time book, YouTube channel, can help 500 people get their first or next rental property. So all you have to do is say one rental at a time helped you some way, somehow. DM me your address, usually on Instagram, and I will mail you one of these cards. So just today, for example, Cindy, Elijah, mm -hmm. Nikki, and Addison are all getting cards. Uh, we've done over 200 cards in about 16 weeks. So we're well on the way to 500. Wow. Once we break 500, uh, we're going to give hopefully $10,000 away to a food bank in Fresno. And I'm going to do something crazy and dye my hair purple just so people can make fun of me. So yeah, we're going to have some fun. So if this interview helps you in any way and you close your first or next deal, tell me and I will count you in the on the way of getting to 500. Wow, congratulations. Um, and you can be reached at uh, one rental at a time on yep. Instagram. Instagram, yeah. All right. <laughs> um, this is so great that you're able to impact so many lives. Mm -hmm. Ryan, it's 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 fun. Mm -hmm. Mind um, sharing with like how you got here, how you got to where you are. Yeah. So what, what I kind of break this story down is my story is probably like a lot of the listeners. Uh, I went, you know, so I uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. So I'm one of the few right that's been here for 50 years. I uh, went to school here, never left. Uh, I got a college degree and then got an advanced college degree. I was living the rat race, as Robert Kiyosaki talks about, and not knowing it. I got to 30 years old, making six figures a year, spending it all, and feeling like a success. In reality, I was a financial train wreck. Uh, I ultimately come to real estate after losing 150 grand in the stock market. I am old enough to have experienced the dot-com crash up close and personal. And uh, that's painful, losing 150 grand. It's, it's not a good feeling. And ultimately go to a physical bookstore back in the day and find that purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it changed my life. It, it set me on a path. I didn't know where it would take me. Financial freedom, I'm sure, was around, but it was not my conversation. My parents only talked about money when they didn't have any, which was most of the time. So I, money was always a stressor, right? It was always a reason to be stressed out because you just never had it. And um, I was just looking at buying rental properties one at a time, you know, back in early 2001, 2002, and found Fresno, California and bought that first house and then bought a second and bought a third. And next thing you know, we have this huge bubble. And I go to a real estate meetup and meet a guy named Bruce Norris back in 2005 or six. And he saved us. So we did a whole bunch of 1031 exchanges, got out of the houses, right before it crashed wow. and got into apartments. So we go from eight to 80 and then the crash goes on and we have no, we have no idea what's going on. I just knew that I couldn't make my ninth house cash flow. That's all I knew. But then, you know, we see houses in, in Fresno fall 75% over three or four years. So we bought the whole way down. 
And then we're buying apartments and doing these other things. So we, we just kept buying one at a time. Very lucky <laughs> timing. Yeah. You got in the right time and out the right time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We, uh, we definitely look at, we study the market. We look every day. So yeah, it was, um, yeah, we, we, we did, we had lots of good moves. Yes. Talking about the markets, um, where, where's your uh, outlook for the next, let's just say, uh, three to five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I look at my market, I'm still looking, I'm still doing deals. I'm still growing. Right. The, the beauty about being a real estate investor is you can keep going. It's not age specific. Uh, so I just closed a duplex like three or four weeks ago, for example. So we're still growing. Uh, I suspect uh, that there's a couple of things you can count on. Uh, I think in, I think interest rates are higher in 2025 than they are today. How much higher? Don't know, but I think they're higher. Uh, I think we have an affordability problem, right? We don't have enough low income or I don't know. I know what you want to call it. Cheap and expensive housing, right? A lot of the housing being built by developers are big housing because that's the only way they can make a profit. So I think we have an affordability problem that really nobody is paid to fix. So um, if you can get in and get cash flow rentals that make sense today and get 30 year debt, um, I'm going to buy as many residential properties as I can in the next two years, getting 30 year money. I think 30 year money is going to be interesting. I'm a little nervous about multifamily. Multifamily is most often evaluated on something called a cap rate. I own some, so I'm, I'm saying this as a guy that owns some. Uh, I think cap rates are artificially low, which makes values artificially high. I think if interest rates go up and if they go up a lot, cap rates have to expand, which hurts values. So Yes, you can argue NOI and rents going up will, will protect you, but that's not a bet I'm willing to make. So I spent the last year taking all of my apartment loans and finding a way to make get them into 30-year money. And usually it's something called a non-QM or non-qualified mortgage lender. So I actually have commercial properties with 30-year money. I don't have any variable rate loans anymore. I spent the last year getting rid of them. Because I'm, I'm afraid. I don't know where rates are, will, will be, right? If rates are 10%, that hurts, right? If rates are six, that hurts. I, I just don't know where they will be. So instead of guessing or waiting, I took action. So that's something that I do, just like I did in 2005 and six when I sold the houses. It's like, I don't want interest rate risk on any of my apartments. So let's go refinance them. So that's what I did. Uh, so what's your outlook on... Um the single family here in Silicon Valley or Bay Area. Yeah, the Bay Area is an interesting bubble. It's very unique. It's, it's, it, it is its own thing. So if we're just talking to Silicon Valley investors or Silicon Valley owners, and I say this as someone who owns in the Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. we really need to watch uh, tech, tech employment. We, we just have to admit that a lot of our housing transactions occur because of stocks or RSUs or whatever, right? A lot of that money comes out of the stock market into a house at some point. A lot of companies went public. A lot of companies got bought. A lot, lot, of, lot of money swimming in the Bay Area. I don't know if that's going to be true in a year. If we have a tech wreck, like we had a dot-com crash, I'm not calling for it. I'm just saying if we did. Um, again, I lived here, lived through that. There was about a six or nine month window where there were essentially no transactions because we had to reset the market, right? The, all the tech stocks got whacked. Anything with the dot-com was worth half or gone. If you were, if you were selling, there were no buyers because nobody had any money. And the folks that did have money were so scared, they didn't want to use it. So the thing in the Valley we have to watch is jobs, right? Tesla just today, I talked about in my daily financial news, is officially moving their HQ to Texas, Austin. Oracle has already done that. HP has done that. If more and more companies do that, problem. What we really have to watch for is the new companies, right? What has made the Bay Area the Bay Area of the 50 years I've lived here is those little, little startups that eventually become something and change the world. When you change the world, you make a lot of people rich. You know, if those small companies stop coming here, right? The, the mm -hmm. MIT grads, the Carnegie Mellons, the whatever it is, uh, Caltech. If they don't come here and incubate in a garage and they do it in Florida because they want to be in Miami's new tech bubble or they want to do it in Austin or Nashville because of no taxes. 
Yeah. Man, the Silicon Valley can be in trouble. I don't know where that goes. I can't answer that question. We really got to watch the next tech innovation. Does it leave the Valley? Because we've proven in the pandemic that you can get out of Dodge. There are a lot of people, a lot yeah. of people that rented left. There are a lot of people that would have normally bought left. There's yeah. a lot of people in the Bay Area. They're like, it's not so bad, you know, <laughs> dialing in and Zoom calling in for work. So I think the Valley is... Um, it could go either way right now. Yeah, and I see like the trend where a lot of companies are actually making their, like working remotely permanent. Yeah, and even uh, worse, I think. So yeah, making jobs permanent. I've actually seen more tech companies. I've been here for a long time, have a lot of relationships in software specifically. More and more of them are telling me they're looking outside the Bay Area first. It used to be higher Bay Area, well, if you're outside the area and you're the best, maybe we'll give you an offer. Now it's like, no, we're going to hire remote first and then only hire locally if we have to. That is a mindset that could be a huge problem as years go by. Totally, yeah. And I also see like these tech companies are hiring cheap labor out of the country. <laughs> oh yeah, think about it. Yeah, I mean, do you really need uh, to hire a, a Stanford grad or a Cal, Cal Berkeley grad to do IT work when you could get 12 of them in Costa Rica or 30 of them in India or, or wherever it is. Yeah, remote work. Remote work is remote work. It doesn't have to be remote in the US. It could be remote, remote across uh, yeah, boundaries. It's, I think the Valley, I've been here a long time and the death of the Valley has been called dozens of times. I think the Valley will respond and, and rejigger. Maybe it becomes biotech or nanotechnology or something else, but I don't know. It's, I'd be nervous. Yeah. Mm. And also um, I, I recently saw your video on Evergrande. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's gonna cause a contagion here in the US? Ah, so we, got to, we have to break Evergrande down in a couple of levels. First and foremost, a lot of people initially thought Evergrande would be Lehman Brothers, right? Lehman Brothers is often seen as the domino that went to zero in contagion. Uh -huh. There's a couple of things that are fundamentally different. Evergrande has hard assets, right? It's buildings, it's soccer stadiums, it's malls, it's houses. Now, well, that, that's good because Lehman had nothing, right? It was a piece of paper. The paper was worth zero, poof. Evergrande, 60 cents on the dollar, 70 cents on the dollar. There's some value there. So it won't be this epic go to zero thing. Now, what else happens? Well, first and foremost, Evergrande was the first, well, won't be the last property developer in China to go to have a problem. There's already been others. Uh, and there will be more, right? China's property market is expensive and a bubble. I'll just say it. China's, China's property market is a bubble and the bubble has been popped. Now the question is, how bad does it get? It's certainly going to hurt local. It's certainly going to hurt cost of capital, right? If you're going to be a new a property developer in China and need external capital, it is going to be wildly expensive, probably cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really going to hurt Chinese citizens. Uh, they just had their, um, I forget what they call it, basically their, their important week where they do all this shopping. They basically, I forget what it's called, but whatever. And... Um, Luxury goods, right? They're not buying as many luxury goods as before. So consumer behavior is changing in China. But will it impact the Bay Area? Will it impact California? Only at the margins. Because there's a lot of money that comes from China when they buy these homes for their kids to go to school. Mm -hmm. Maybe we see less of that. But maybe we see more. Right now, capitalism and wealth is under attack in China. Right? The powers that be are like, success is bad. Millionaires are bad. We're coming for you. We're like, they'll come into your house and take you. So some of them could be, you know, trying to get more capital out, which would mean maybe they buy more and more empty homes, right? I was in LA two years ago and went, went to like four or five open houses and all of them were owned by Chinese and they were empty. They were just like a bank. They just, they just kept them there. They also, we'll have, we'll have to see. Uh, but I think the thing that helps the US is I think China's money gets more expensive but that just means all the cash, it has to go somewhere in all the world uh, feds are printing money. So I think a lot of money comes to the US and rates stay 
artificially low longer, which really could help the Bay Area, right? The Bay Area has stupid high prices. You know, when you when you have an interest rate at three percent and it goes to four percent, it really doesn't hurt you all that much if you have a fifty k house. It crushes you if you have a two point five million dollar house, right? That payment explodes higher, so it will have an outsized impact on the Bay Area. So we have to watch interest rates. I'm not sure that Evergrande will hurt our rates. In fact, it could help. So that's a long answer. Got it. Okay. Um, so. Let's talk about like your experience now, <laughs> enough of the doom and gloom. <laughs> um, yeah, how how did you get into um, you know like two hundred two hundred like homes? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, there's kind of a couple of big steps, right? We were buying all the time. First and foremost, uh, this is a story of two people. It's not just Michael's story. It's Michael and Olivia. Uh, we got on the same page uh, at thirty. We started living below our means, right? We talked about wasting money. So we started whacking expenses. We started living on 50% of our income. That was a big step. Because when you save that much, you can just buy that much faster. So we bought, uh, we had 40 grand saved when we started that bought three houses. Then we started recycling capital. We did a cash out refi and bought two more and did another one. So we get to eight. Uh, as I said earlier, we did 1031 exchanges from eight to 80. Then we start borrowing private money, hard money on the way down. And, uh, you know, that gets us to whatever, 150, something like that. And we just, on the return, we just, we just keep buying. We keep growing. Like I said, I bought a duplex a couple of weeks ago. So, um, yeah, you just, you just keep buying. We've been buying about it. We buy about, we buy something every three or four months. And it really starts by knowing your market, having a buy box, having a good network and always be looking, right? It's always a great day to do a great deal. Uh, I don't believe in timing the market. I believe time mm -hmm. in the market is important. For example, uh, when people talk about our first property that I write about in that book, Norris Drive, I put 20% down on that first house in 2002. That 20 grand is turned into 21 units today via 1031 exchanges. It's turned into half a million dollars in net worth and it turned into a hundred grand in cash via growth and 1031 and sales and things of that nature. So time in the market is a lot better than timing the market. This is not stocks. This is not crypto. Uh, we've, we've certainly bought something every year for more than 20 years or, or 20 years, I guess, at this point. So yeah, you just, you just start with one and then you buy two and you just, you just keep going. So, yeah. Uh, do you, do you um, invest, still invest in uh, stocks? Or no, no. Uh, once you lose 150 grand in stocks, you generally don't go back. So I have not been back. <laughs> Why is that flickering? Yeah, I don't know. My Wi-Fi is not great, I guess. I don't know. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, it's on my end. Sorry. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess uh, what I, what I want to ask is how, um, how do, okay, so for example, like a millennial, right? A young, a young 20-something um, year sure. old, um, you know, what, what would be your biggest tip or advice for uh, a first-time first home buyer who mm -hmm. you know, wants to buy a home, you know, maybe making about 70 to 100K? Yeah. Yeah, this is this is something I have a particular passion for because I, I interview and consider friends like uh, Todd Baldwin from CNBC, Millennial Money, a friend. I just talked to him an hour ago uh, and other folks who have done house hacking. What I would tell people to do, you know, in your 20s is, is to is to house hack either do the traditional way, which is to buy a fourplex or you can do what Todd Baldwin did. He, he, he bought a half a million dollar home in Seattle at 23 years old. 18 grand down. So 3%. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, three, three, it's only 18 grand or I mean 3%. And then he had roommates. He bought a five bedroom home. He lived in the master bedroom and rented out the other four. He just sold that property. We just talked about it. And that 18 grand, uh, first off generated 24 grand a year in income because he made two grand a month and lived for free. And then when he sold it, that $500,000 home was sold for over 800. So he made 300 grand. Um, that's the key is 
is a lot of people talk about the latte factor, right? Don't drink Starbucks lattes or Pete's coffee or whatever your coffee drink is. That is a um, slow way to build wealth, right? Six bucks at a time. What I would challenge a young person to do is just admit your highest expense is housing, either it's rental or a mortgage. And what I would tell you to do is do something different. Um, have roommates or buy a fourplex and, and live below your means and actually get paid to live there. Todd was paid to live in his house two grand a month. Mm-hmm. And he didn't have housing, right? So he has a lot more money to save for the second and the third and the fourth. Uh, one of the guys I talked to weekly, um, he was a little bit older, but he was 91,000 in debt, had three kids. And that's exactly what he did. And he made work completely optional in 10 years. Uh, one of the guys I talked with is a ninth grade dropout. Mm-hmm. Talk about a hard life, right? Ninth grade dropout. He house hacked. He bought a multifamily and, and lived in one and rented out the others. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Silicon Valley people want to own a home and flex and have the yard and all of that stuff. That's great if you want to be house rich and cash poor. I suggest if you want to get, if you want to make work optional, you want to be financially free, go look at your biggest expense and take it to zero. So that's what I would tell you to do. And that's most likely rent, right? (laughs) Well, I mean, it's rent. I mean, you could live in a multifamily. I mean, there's lots of things you could do. I, I think the best answer for most people is if you're really young, you can have roommates. So buy a five bedroom home and rent four rooms. If you're older and you're in a relationship or having roommates, just not your thing, go buy a duplex, triplex or a quad because you can get 30 year money fixed, low down payment. Find a way. It's usually more expensive. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it's, you know, you can get in for 3% down. Oh, I, I need your plug there. Three <laughs> percent. That's really low. <laughs> yeah. yeah, three, three and a half percent down. So FHA conventional. There's five percent down loan programs for fourplexes. They're out there. This is the payment is very high, right? Right, but you're gonna have, yeah, the payment's gonna be high, of course. But mm-hmm. ideally, you're gonna have three or four other people paying it for you, and then you get all the equity, you get all the upside, and you live for free, or you live very cheaply. Yeah, totally agree. So, uh, you know, if any um, any suggestions on uh, tips to weather the crisis, you know, mm-hmm. you know, like um, it always might happen, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I would tell people again. I've been doing this a long time, and I saw the last crisis. I saw people go bankrupt. I saw people lose homes. I saw lots and lots of pain. Uh, mm-hmm. Pain comes and goes. What I would tell you to do is never bet on appreciation. A lot of people in the Bay Area are betting on appreciation. Why would you buy a 1950s home in Palo Alto for 1.8 million that hasn't been updated? It's because you think it'll be worth 2 million in a couple of years. That is stupid thinking. Don't bet on appreciation. It should be in part of your calculations. Only bet, only use cash flow. Only get 30 year debt. A lot of people, even Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey, is famous for telling people, pay off your debt, pay off your debt. What he fails to tell people is how he went bankrupt, which he did in real estate, is he was flipping properties with 90-day debt. If you ever get 90-day debt in real estate, you're stupid. You're just dumb. Uh, You should get 30-year debt, not 90-day debt. So he was flipping properties. He had a portfolio worth 4 million, debt of 3 million, but nobody would refi his debt after 90 days. So it all came due. And he was forced to liquidate and bankrupt. Even though he had a million dollars in equity, he couldn't raise it in 90 days. So don't do that. Get 30 of your money. Don't bet on appreciation. Don't follow the herd. Don't buy cheap. I see a lot of California investors going out of state and I ask them why. Their answer is it's cheap. You can go broke buying cheap. Um, If you want to go there for a better yield and you've done your homework, fine. But too many people are lazy. They just look at a spreadsheet. They see some interview somewhere and go, Ohio, Detroit, this, that. And if you're not doing your homework, you don't have a network, you're going to lose money. So there's lots of recommendations. All right. And how do you, um, how do you propose uh, beginners, you know, to, to find 
a deal, right? You know, especially nowadays at this current market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I believe real estate investing is a skill, Cindy. So what I tell people to do is focus on learning the skill. You don't jump to the end and say, where's the deal? You have to pay the price. You have to learn a market. For me, it starts with a buy box. Make your buy box really small. Then look at your buy box every day for 90 days in a row. And by the end of 90 days, you should be able to know what's in the buy box. And the, the key for people watching this is when you have a buy box, you don't look at anything else. It's only this. And um, most people won't do that. They get bored or they, they, they try to outthink the process. So what I tell people to do is pick a buy box. My buy box in 2002 was 93703, so one zip code, single family homes, three or four bedrooms, two baths, uh, between like 13 and 1700 square feet. That's all I looked at for three years. So have a tight focus and don't deviate. Mm. And you just, uh, do you do any uh, cold calling or how do you, how did you get that? For so uh, I, I, everything I bought, everything I retired on was out of the MLS. No cold calling, no, no mailers, no door knock, no driving for dollars, no bird dogs, no texting. No wholesalers. I've certainly used that stuff now, but in the beginning, you got to remember, I had a tech job. I was probably on three continents in a week. I didn't have time for any of that. I had a, I had a phone and internet connection. So I looked at my buy box and I wrote offers out of the MLS. Mm. All right. So everything was on MLS. <laughs> very, very lucky. Yeah. And was there a lot of offers at the time? Well, again, I've been doing this a long time. 2002, three, 2002, three, four, kind of a lukewarm. Mm. Five, six was really hot. Mm. Um, seven, eight, nine, cold, really cold. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it changes, okay. um, hot and cold. It's pretty hot now. I mean, in 2020, for example, I think I wrote 100 offers and got nothing. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's the dedication there 100 yeah. offers <laughs> and got none yeah all right um any uh final thoughts uh, tips yeah what i what i'm trying to spend the rest of my life doing is getting people to realize that if real estate investing can get you there uh, it promises a better financial future it can't promise financial freedom because I'm not sure most people will stick around long enough. The first three, four, five years of real estate investing are hard. Cash flow is low. You're not getting much appreciation. But the longer you're in the game, the better it gets. So that's what I'm trying to help people see. Is it's definitely worth it. You just got to hold on. And uh, I see that you're also so um, you have like a course or something that you're. Yeah. Offering. So I wrote I wrote this book that's behind my shoulder called One Rental at a Time. Uh, it's, it's not a how-to book. It's basically my story. How do we go from buying one house to financial freedom through a crazy real estate market? So that book comes out, uh, I think it came out in 2018, really successful for a self-published, 10, over 10,000 copies sold. But what happens when you have a successful book like that is a lot of people go, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? How'd you do it? So I spent about six months, I, maybe two years ago now, creating a course, how to get started one rental at a time. So that course there, it's on Teachable. And because of my brand, other experts have added material. So I added content for raising private money, um, house hacking, or, um, self management, Airbnb, uh, all of these things. So the course is ridiculously cheap at two ninety nine, and gives a face and gives a Facebook group uh, that I talk to every Saturday at nine a.m. So uh, definitely spending a lot of time making sure those folks are successful. Right. I, I really recommend everyone to, you know, who wants to learn about fur and growing financial freedom and cash flow like yourself um, to sign up for the course. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so any, uh, how, how, how do people reach you? I'm uh, very active creating YouTube content. The channel, of course, is called One Rental at a Time. I put out five videos seven days a week. So that's the best way. If you want to met, direct message me, it's best on Instagram. Of course, one rental at a time. So if you want to direct message me, Instagram is probably best. 
but if you want to watch what I talk about every day, I'm on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. Have a great, um, have a great day and uh, look forward, looking forward to seeing you in the next show. You got it.